places now so we can begin. It looks like Donna's all alone at this table. Oh, Stephanie's coming. Oh, good. I wouldn't want her to be alone. There we go. Well, welcome to everyone. We have a few new faces again tonight, so I hope you find them in the crowd and be sure that you say hello and introduce yourselves. Um, But I'm really excited to be here tonight to share with you um, a really great topic, which is all about the communion of saints and our, the position of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the communion of saints. So I'm excited to get started, but let's begin with just a little short prayer, if you would. So let us begin in the name of the Father, Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, we thank you for gathering us together tonight on this beautiful evening. And we are very grateful tonight for all of the many blessings in our lives, for all of the people who've gone before us, who've set the example for us, the the believers and those who have prayed for us throughout the years. And tonight as we talk about our lives and their lives and your presence in all of our lives, help us to open our hearts and minds to the truth of your message we ask that you send your spirit and let it dwell among us and sink down into our souls tonight. And we lift up and pray for anyone that we're concerned about. We'll offer the evening for them. Anyone in our family or friends who might need our prayers tonight. And help us once again to just be good servants, good students, and to spread your light into the world. And we make this in all our prayers, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this past week has been a really fun cultural week for people in America, because on Friday night, we had, you know, our very big cultural celebration of Halloween. And, um, I've been noticing the past few years how Halloween is just becoming more and more of a big deal. You know, people are like putting lights on their house, you know, and buying all these decorations and expensive costumes and planning for it. Um, Anyway, so it's, it's, you know, it's become really important to people. And I was really thinking about that a lot in terms of how fascinated... We all are, even as children, with this whole concept of death and dying and being scared, scaring ourselves, you know. And we're kind of making light of it on Halloween, you know. We're kind of just laughing about it and kids enjoy dressing up and all of that. But, um, you know, but there's a really profound truth behind any time we have a cultural big deal like that. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you just a little bit first of all, about the Christian connection to Halloween and where it really came from and what we celebrate then in the church. The word Halloween, most of you probably know this, but I'm just going to reteach this to you. The word Halloween actually mean, came as a derivation, let's say, of the term All Hallows Eve. So it was the Eve of a hallowed day, and it was the eve, October 31st, of the hallowed day, which is a big holy day called All Saints Day, which we celebrate on November 1st. Of course, you know, we we need to go way back. I mean, yeah, okay, Halloween has some very pagan origins. All of the Christian holidays, including Christmas itself, has actually pagan beginnings that were Christianized. And we'll talk more about Christmas and all that later, but when it comes to All Saints Day, this was a perfect time to celebrate All Saints by Christianizing or changing a big celebration about the dead and all of the superstition that went with it. So All Saints Day is what we celebrate on November the 1st. And November the 2nd, we celebrate what's called All Souls Day. 
Now, what do we mean by that? Basically, what we mean is that um, we're really meditating and connecting ourselves to our very deep and profound belief in the afterlife. That even though we will, our bodies will die, the Christian belief is that we will never die. Our souls will not die, and, um, but rather will be transformed or resurrected, if you want to use that term. Because basically everything that happens to Christ, to Jesus, in his lifetime, is going to happen to us, is happening to us, and will continue to happen to us. Let's think about that for a minute. For example, you know, we're born. We're born into our life. We have a childhood. Things happen to us. Eventually, as we grow older, we experience suffering. Some of us experience more profound suffering than others do, just like Jesus did. We, we experience betrayal by our friends. We experience misunderstandings, um, and so on and so forth. But eventually, we all experience that suffering. In a sense, the cross of Jesus comes to all of us sometime in our lives, and sometimes over and over again. Okay, but our belief then is that when the cross came to Jesus, he looked through death and conquered death, conquered it, and then was resurrected. He was resurrected bodily and spiritually. And eventually, he ascended. He left this earth. We call that the ascension. And a new Pentecost came. He sent his spirit. A new Pentecost came into the world. The same thing happens to us. We suffer. We are going to die, but we will experience resurrection and a new Pentecost. And so if we think of our lives as one long continuum, basically we're just pilgrims traveling from one place to another. In our creed that we say every Sunday which remember I told you way back in the beginning when we were talking about what Catholics believe, I told you that our creed is our dogma. These are the things that don't change that we're going to continue to believe all of our lives. So in our creed, every Sunday, we profess our dogma. And part of it is that we believe, you know, in the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. And right before that, we say we believe in the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So we are professing that, but what do we really mean by that? Do we all understand really what that is, is what we're really saying? And it, and it all comes down to, as I mentioned, this grafting onto Christ that happens to us at baptism so that we are one with him and are experiencing the same things he experienced. All of us will experience. So on All Saints Day and All Souls Day, we're acknowledging that in a very big way. We're talking about what happens after we leave this earth. A lot of people don't like to talk about it, you know. But as Christians, we can have no fear because we have this divine promise that we will be resurrected. So November 1st, then, All Saints Day. Who are the saints? I'm going to show you a video in a couple of minutes, Father Robert Barron. He's going to explain it to you even better than I can, (laughs) okay? Um, Although I do love talking about the saints. But All Saints Day is a day that we're really celebrating all of the people who are now in union with Christ, in union with him. You know, and if we want to use the term heaven, okay, these are the people that have made their pilgrim journey through this earth, have died, and we believe are in union now with him in heaven. That would include a lot of different people. We have special people in the Catholic Church that we put a big S-T, a capital S-T in front of their name, Saint Edward the Confessor. St. Michael, 
St. Elizabeth, I could go on and on. You know, all the St. Francis, all of the many saints. So some of them are canonized saints. The canon, the, ma- the magisterium of the church, has recognized them and said, yes, they are in union with Christ now. They are in heaven. And then there's others, little s, like I believe my mother and maybe your mother, grandmother, aunt, uncle, friend, who were extremely wonderful, holy people that they are now in union with Christ. So on November 1st, we celebrate all of them. We call it All Saints Day. It's what's known as a holy day of obligation. I hate that term, but holy day of opportunity. Okay, let's change it around a little bit. Holy day of obligation basically for a Catholic means I have to go to Mass that day. I like to say, I am invited to celebrate all of the saints on All Saints Day by going to Mass and being in communion with them. Remember, I think I've told you before, but I'm going to remind you again, being a Catholic is all about believing in a corporate community expression of religion. Catholics believe that we do not act in isolation no matter what we do. So it's not going to be Jesus and me for all eternity, which you see on the bumper stickers here and there. Instead, it's Jesus and me and all of you. We are all connected. We are all in a communion together. We'll all know each other for eternity if we're all in the same place, which we all will be, right? Anyway, so... Um, so that's the communion of saints. We're celebrating that on All Saints Day. On All Souls Day, which is, happens the day after, and actually this year it was on Sunday. It's kind of unusual. Um, but All Souls Day is a day that we remember everyone who is still on the journey. All souls. So that would include you and I and everyone who's departed that we're not sure exactly where they are. Those who have departed, those who are dead, you know, that are still journeying on a journey. And remember, Catholics believe that sometimes there are souls who die who aren't ready for the communion. And so they continue to journey. And it may take them a while to continue to journey, but eventually will become in union with Christ. That's what we call All Souls Day. On All Saints Day... The saints pray with us. They pray for us. We don't worship them. We honor them. But mainly we're asking them, because they are in union with Christ, to pray for us. Okay? To pray for us. And we pray with them. I ask them to pray for me. All Souls Day are all of us who still need our prayers. So when we pray for the all souls on All Souls Day, we're praying for everyone still on the journey. You and I and everyone who has departed, that we're not sure where they are at this point. Okay, so we're praying for them because we believe they need our prayers. I need your prayers. I think you need mine too, right? Okay, and so all of these others that have died too, we remember them. Okay, so that's what All Saints Day, Holy Day of Obligation or Opportunity (laughs) All Souls Day is not a holy day of obligation, but we consider it to be very important. So it's two whole days in the church. We're celebrating the afterlife of what's happening on our journey, our journey of faith. Um, Up here on my table, I just have a bunch of pictures and icons and things of different people. And again, as I mentioned when we had our night on what Catholics believe, We don't believe in worshiping these statues, okay? People think we're idol worshipers. But but as you can see, they're they're pictures. These are all pictures from my office. I have lots of things in there. But I like to look at them because they remind me of all my heroes. These are all the saints in my life, some of them that I love. And here's a picture of just an ordinary woman. This isn't my mom. This is um, her name was Sheila. She's a a woman I worked with when I first started here at St. Edward. She and some of other ladies in this parish started the faith formation program for children. And um, she passed away quite a few years ago, but, I, but she still lives on. 
So I, I consider her to be a saint with a little s, so that's why I have her. This is Mary Magdalene, St. Bernadette, Edith Stein, St. Francis, and everybody knows who this is, Mother Teresa. And then I just have my big Mary statue because she belongs in the communion of saints as well. But I'm going to wait and talk about Mary in just a little while, okay? We're going to stay on the saints for a minute. All right, so I'm going to show you a really wonderful video about the communion of saints. And I know you probably have lots of questions. And Father Robert Barron, who is narrating this, is a theologian. And a lot of times he talks pretty above most people because he's so smart. But he's also a good communicator, so I think you'll find him interesting. But please try to write down questions or jot down things um, as you're speaking so that we can discuss them after we see it. Now, the whole video is an hour, so we're not going to do the whole thing, but we're going to do some pieces of it. So what I'm going to do is I'll show you a little bit. We'll stop and have some talk, and then we'll go back to it. Does that sound good? Okay, so give me a chance here. Don't turn the lights off yet, Elizabeth. Not yet. Okay. All right, as, as soon as everyone can return to your seats, um, I'd like to just talk to you for a few minutes about the things that you heard, that you discussed. I'm going to turn this down just a little bit. Okay. Um, I have some questions up here as well. So maybe what I'll do is I'll start with these questions, and then maybe that'll spur some other questions as well. Are you with me? Thank you. Some of these questions are, are easy, and other ones are a little are going to require a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, explanation, but I'll try. Um, this one's a really easy one, so I'm going to start with that. If everyone can kind of gather back again, and okay, this one says, "Why do we call Edward a confessor?" Okay, Con- confessor was a title that was given to. St. Edward, who was actually a king of England. He was the king of England. Um, And the reason he was called confessor is not because he heard confessions, because he wasn't a priest. He was a king. Um, The reason that he was called confessor is because in in, in the time that he was was in reign, when he was the king of England, um, there was no confession as we know it today. They didn't have individual confession. At that time, if um, you did something really awful, a grave sin, a mortal sin, like you apostatized, you you committed a murder, you committed adultery, something that the whole community knew about, basically what would happen is they would shun you from, from going to Mass, from going to communion. And so... In some churches, you probably have seen this if you know anything about the Middle Ages, but in some churches, they would actually have you stand outside the church wearing sackcloth and ashes, doing penance, until the community decided you could come back. A confessor was someone who uh, would walk with you, would be like a spiritual companion, somebody that was well-respected. And so the confessor would go before the community and beg the community to take you back (laughs) when you were ready. And so you can imagine what this is like, kind of like a godparent or sponsor today, where the person is with you on your journey and encouraging you. But this was even more, because very public. So St. Edward was um, not only a king, but he was also a, a very compassionate man, Uh, a very much a a man of the people, especially a champion of the poor and downtrodden and sinners. (laughs) So he got the title of confessor because he would go before the communities and beg them to let these people come back, and that's how he got that title. So it isn't that he heard confessions, although I'm sure he had many. I mean, there were probably a lot of people saying things to him. It was really a special title given to him. And others, you'll hear of others, too. Okay, this one said, um, how many saints are there? Well, thousands, thousands of canonized saints. Canonized meaning they've gone through the process, 
and they have ST in front of their name. And that was um, actually another question someone asked me. How do, what is the process of canonization? <clears throat> well, you know, it's kind of a complicated process, but pretty simple in, in some ways. I can explain it to you pretty easily. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, if a person leads a really holy life and everybody knows it, Eventually, people talk and they say, this person is a saint, needs to be acknowledged as a saint. And so um, after gathering a lot of information about the person, they would, um, they would go, and okay, first of all, someone asked me, can you be canonized when you're alive? No, you have to be dead, okay? <laughs> That's the first <laughs> requirement. <clears throat> Normally, they wait five years after you die before your name can be brought up as someone, a candidate for sainthood. Although the Pope can decide, he can kind of override any, any rule when it comes to that. So, yeah. I don't know, just five years. It takes, they figure that it takes that long to gather the information and for enough people to say this person should be a saint, this person should be a saint, 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 you know. But it will take them a while. So after five, five years have to be passed, and then the bishop of wherever the person is in, whatever diocese the person is in, has to um, be responsible for beginning the investigation. So in other words, let's say that Tom McDonald passes away, and we all know he's a saint, right? So five years from now, one of you would go to the bishop, Bishop of Orange, and say, we, we, want, we think Tom should be a saint. And he would have to say, okay, I'll look into it. And he'd start an investigation. Um, and um, sometimes the bishop will put together groups of people and they start digging up all the information about Tom. They're going talking to people and all of that. And um, they'll get witnesses. They have a tribunal that they call people to. And, um, you know, they just they look at all his virtues and all of that sort of thing. So once the investigation is finished and they decide that he is worthy of going forward, then um, they, make an, they take it to another... Um, step, and, then, and this is a step at the Vatican where it's the congregation of the cause for sainthood. So you would, you would go to that, that name would go there. And then what happens after that is uh, they have this panel of theologians, I don't know, like nine or ten of them, that start studying the person's life. And they really try hard to dig up the dirt on the person, too, to, prove, to disprove <laughs> that this, this person was a saint. And they get together, you know, a couple times a month. They go over all of the documents. They talk about it. Um, and then if, if they're favorable, they vote. I think if it's a majority vote, if they vote and he passes that, then it goes to the pope. Okay, then, then the pope would be the one that would either declare that person, yes, that, you know, the, that it's, that they're worthy. They're, they're venerable. They call them venerable. So then um, after Tom is declared venerable, that's the first step. Second step would be another, um, you know, another whole investigation into his life to find out if a miracle happened, if, he, if he, a miracle was associated with him. That usually takes a long time to prove that. You know? So if they prove that, if they prove that a miracle has happened you know, as when he was alive, associated with him, then eventually they would call him blessed, blessed. And then that would be step two. And then step three is canonization. And this is even harder because the step three, they have to prove that a miracle has happened because of his intercession after he died. So somebody that's alive would have had to have experienced a miracle based on his intercession. Are you following me? So that's why it takes so long. So it can take a long, long time to prove all of that stuff. Why do they do that? Well, because, you know, they want to make sure <laughs> that if we're, the church is going to put the big ST in front of your name that you really are a saint. Now, again, as I said, the Pope can decide that these steps can go quicker. And, and John Paul was, oh, he loved declaring saints. More saints were declared by John Paul than any other papacy, I think, before him, because so many cases were just, you know, suspended because they couldn't prove this or that, and he, he just, he was a lot more liberal when it came to 
you know, declaring people saints. So a lot of people became saints when he was pope. And I think Francis is kind of the same way, and there were quite a few with Benedict as well. So the pope can speed up the process, but normally it takes quite a while. So that kind of... And then once they're a saint, they're a saint, they, you know, except in the ca- case of St. Christopher. Um, also remember that you can become a saint if you're martyred for your faith. The Pope can just declare you a saint. You don't have to go through any of that. So if you die for your faith, you're an immediate saint. Okay, so that's sainthood by blood, I guess they call it, by sacrifice. Um, in the early church, they didn't have canonization. They just did it by acclamation. So you find a lot of saints in the early church that didn't go through the process. The process took a while to really uh, unfold. There was a time, too, and and I understand this happens still today, um, especially um, later than the Middle Ages, later than that, that one of the steps was that they would... um, they uncover the body. They'd go and they'd dig you up. <laughs> and they'd look at the remains to see if there was any sign of sanctity. Because the idea was that it was, it was sin that causes decay of the body. And so when they would unearth the bones or the, the corpse of the person, a lot of times they'd find them beautifully intact, not decayed at all, even after hundreds of years. And so that was a sign of sanctity, sainthood, and then um, that would definitely be a miracle, okay? So they would, that would be part of it. Um, in, in the early church, too, they venerated the bones of the saints, which is why he was talking about relics. They would, when they would, um, you know, when they would take the corpse and look at it and decide that they were a saint, they would also use pieces of their bone, you know, for relics. They would venerate them because they considered them holy. And, you know, you might see people have relics. A lot of people have them. I have a couple of them. It's just a tiny little bone chip that you have, but people venerated them. Also, they would put them in the altars. Um, so every part of that person was considered holy and, and worthy of venerating. It sounds kind of weird, I know, to all of us, but, um, <laughs> but it definitely was a practice in the early church. Okay, um, so that's the process of canonization. Um, okay, this one, the live one, nope. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. It says that, is the, is, are there Catholic churches on Indian reservations? Almost certainly there are. Yes, there were many, many saints or, or you know, missionaries who went to Christianize the Native Americans and established many churches throughout the the United States on Indian reservations. So yes, they're all over the place um, on them. Okay, and I'm sure you wondered about that when you saw Catherine Drexel. Um, okay, it's a good one. Why does it seem that the main way to become a saint is to live a life of dedication in a convent or monastery? That's a great. That's a great question. I love that. <clears throat> Actually, you know, there are a lot of saints who are that were lay people moms and dads and people like that. It's just that I think we hear more about, you know, the ones that were in monasteries or in convents. Um, Because, you know, it's it's a single-minded life. They've totally given their life to the church. And so I think, you know, that's why you see so many more like that. But there really were a lot of lay people who were also saints. St. Francis was not a priest. Here is a little picture of him. Even though he wore, you know, he, he, the great order, the Franciscans, but he wasn't a priest. He was just a plain guy that loved God so much that he gave up everything. And people and, and other people started following him because he was so, he had such so much charisma and was so in love with Jesus that he was sort of thought of as sort of, you know, saintly even then. So, um, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't in a monastery. A lot of his followers were later, but he wasn't. The Franciscans, too, do not live in cloister. When you saw Therese, she was a Carmelite, a cloistered Carmelite. Not all the Carmelites are cloistered, but they were. Cloister means you go in and, and you don't talk to anybody and you're behind the screens and all of that. 
But not all of them were like that. There's many, many orders, Dominicans, that are teachers and nurses and doctors that are out working in the world. So it, it kind of does seem like that, but I think if you start researching the saints, you're going to find out that they're from all walks of life, every continent, every age. Um, some are religious, some are not. You know, So it, it just seems like it because those are the ones we hear about maybe the most. Um, but I'm going to challenge you tonight to start really looking them up because when you are, con- if you decide to be a Catholic and you're going to be confirmed, you get to choose a saint to emulate and take their name. So start looking, start researching. If you put Catholic saint into any search engine, a trillion things will come up. <laughs> things you don't want to see too. <laughs> so I will try to give you some good links to go to. <laughs> On the, on the website, but you want to start really thinking about who you would like to be a friend in the, you know, in the spiritual who can be your companion. And that sounds pretty weird, I think, to people that aren't Catholic. We're used to the idea, those of us that were raised in the church. Um, but if you really follow the logic of this, that we believe they're still alive and are powerful and can intercede for us, um, it's, it's a real great comfort. And as you get to know them better, get to know their lives better, um, you'll find that you can have a relationship with them. I know it sounds really weird, but they are, are, it's unbelievable how many people I know that have close relationships with different saints because they read their lives, they ask them to pray with them, and pretty soon you just feel like they're with you all the time you know so um so i'm I'm going to challenge you to start looking if you have a you know where to start people always ask me well if you have a saint's name if your first name is a saint's name you know that's always a good place to start how many saints are named peter not just peter the pope there's many others i don't think there's a donna i I don't don't think so not yet anyway okay but um (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, in the early church, when you, when, you became, when you were baptized, you took on a new name. You left your pagan life behind and your pagan name behind. And you notice in the scriptures, Jesus always renaming people. You know, Peter wasn't Peter. Peter was Simon. So he, he changed Simon's name to Peter because Peter meant rock, and he wanted to build the church on the rock, you know. Um, and then, like, St. Paul's name was Saul, and he changed it when he became a Christian to Paul. So they, they believed that their identity dwelled in their name. And so they would, if they became Christian, they got rid of the old name, took on a new one, a saint's name. So I'm going to challenge you. So if your name is a saint, you can always take your own name, your baptismal name, which will show the connection between baptism and confirmation, um, or you can take a new one. Kind of the tradition that was developing in the modern world was when, when different names, people wanted different names for their kids. When that developed, then the Catholic Church would say, well, then the middle name became the saint's name. You could name your first name anything you wanted, but your middle name, like I'm Donna, but my middle name is Anne, you know, because of Anne, St. Anne. Now that's kind of gone away too. We don't really have that anymore. When you see the list of babies that are baptized in the church, a lot of them are made-up names or whatever, family names. Um, So we've kind of gone away from that, but not in confirmation. That's why when you're confirmed, you get to choose a saint's name, to have that connection, to have that spiritual mentor with you. Okay, so that's it. I digress on that. This one's kind of interesting. Who is the prince of the saints? I think there's only one prince, okay, and that's Jesus, you know. And, but he wasn't a saint. I don't think there is such a thing. And then what, who, who is the queen of the saints? And that's Mary. And we're, you know, I, I want to talk about her a little bit before we, before we go on, um, before we adjourn tonight. So I will talk about her in a minute. Tell me what else. What else are you thinking out there? What were you talking about in your groups? Is this intriguing you? Is it getting to you or whatever? Is it new to you? Thinking about this. Yeah? No? Are you enjoying, did you enjoy the movie? Did you like that? Okay. <laughs> There's actually, okay, Aliyah, do you have a comment? Mm-hmm. 
Right. Can you hear her? No. It can be one of the most difficult things to express, but her commitment to be love within the heart of the church was just, it really just, it really struck me, you know, because it can be challenging to express that, especially with people who are difficult to love. Um, but that's what we're called to do. So that's something that, that really just struck a chord with me. I thought that was really beautiful that she committed her life to that. Yeah. You know, and if you read the, her life, um, there's so many examples, many, many, many. She talks about it all the time in her story of a soul. If you want to read that book he was talking about, um, she talks so <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is about how he talked about the crabby nun that she had to take care of and she learned to love her. And she, I mean, she talks about, you know, picking up a sock with, with love in her heart. She didn't want to pick it up, but she picked it. I mean, it was, all her things are the little way, very, all these little ways that added up to big ways. And she said on her deathbed that she would continue to love people and have, and pray for conversions after she died and that she thought she was going to do more good work. I mean, this is a little 24-year-old girl in a convent nobody knew. But she said afterward that when she got to heaven, she was going to send a shower of roses to the earth, and that everyone that knew about her, she would continue to pray for. And look at what's happened. I mean, she, everyone, she's one of the most beloved saints um, in, mo- in the modern world. So that's kind of a miracle in and of itself, right? Yeah. So that's kind of, you know... Um, I, I'm glad you picked up on that. That was really good. How did you like it when he said that we're all called to sainthood and that a saint is someone who has allowed Jesus to get into their boat? <laughs> I love that. Isn't that kind of a really neat, like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> you know, because Jesus doesn't force himself into your boat. You know, Jesus never forces himself on anyone. It's always up to us to invite him. Invite it, get into my boat. So that's what he says a saint really is. I love that image. Anything else? There's, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Um, He mentioned that a saint is somebody that allows Jesus to invade their life. And I'm just wondering if anybody has a problem. I used to have this problem. If I did that, do I use, lose my uniqueness? Am I somehow going to lose who I really am if I allow Jesus to invade my life? Anybody think that? Agree with that yet? Yeah. Sandy? i talk on the mic because that'll go. We were just talking about the saints and just sharing a little bit of what he was talking about. And Blanca was sharing with us how her mother and her aunts had shared a beautiful relationship with the saints and how daily they had a different saint that they prayed with and honored, um, used in their lives as an example for to hand on to Blanca as a, a heritage. And I thought that was really neat to think that we can do something that practical and active for our lives. I agree with, with you that it's so challenging to, to, to let uh, God into our lives because we're human beings and we want to maybe both things. But like when I was hearing and watching, it's like I'm afraid. I'm very afraid. Like, like I know that I have a call, but... I maybe I'm not hearing it correctly or I don't want to hear it. And based on what I said, I came with a very strong Catholic, my mom and aunts and everybody. So it's like even challenging that I know this and sometimes I get away with it and it's not, it's not good. It's not good. That's, thank you for your honesty. That, that's, that's so true. That's why we don't let God in because we know we're, we're going to change, and we're not sure we want that. You know, we don't know what that's about. We don't. We we sort of want it, but we want our own, we want what's comfortable and what we know. Um, so I think that's part of the struggle, is is just 
saying yes to that. And it's not just a one yes. It's a yes every day. Think of what he said about Therese, how she had this spiritual darkness at the end. And you hear that through all many, many lives of the saints where they experience that doubt and that distance. Can you hang in there through that? You know, but remember that took her whole journey for her to be able to, to embrace that. So, yeah, it's the unknown. It's, you know, we're much more comfortable even if we're not leading a very good life. Or com- at least it's my life, right? <laughs> you know, so that's, that's an important point. Anybody else have a comment on that? But I don't want to be a saint, right? <laughs> I'm going to have to change my life, you know? Anybody over here comment anymore? Um, yeah, I, I, I grapple with that a lot too, especially at the beginning of the journey. You know, it was sort of like, not me, not me, not me, not me, no, 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 you know? <laughs> and so um, I, I will share this little story about myself. When I went through my profound con- conversion, um, and remember I told you I was Catholic, I mean, I was raised a Catholic, but I was um, a cultural Catholic in some ways. Um, got away from the church for about 10 years, came back. When I came back, I had this profound conversion experience that I kept to myself for quite a while because I was too afraid. I, I didn't know, I had no one to talk to. I didn't know anybody that was Catholic. I was in California without my family. And, um, and I, I knew it was going to shake up everything. I just had this feeling that was going to really profoundly change my life. And so, you know, I, I waited and waited and waited. And finally, I decided that the next time I, I was coming to Mass, nobody knew me, didn't know anyone. I was just waiting for someone to notice me. It was so silly. But anyway, um, I decided if somebody asked me to do something, I would say yes, whatever it was. So I told God that's okay, look, you know, I I don't know, I'm not very good, but, you know, I'll say yes. So the first time someone did ask me to do something, I said no, <laughs> because, <laughs> because it was something I didn't want to do. <laughs> it was actually Sheila who called me up and said, oh, um, you know, I was told you're a teacher. I was a, a teacher at Saddleback College. I was told you're a teacher, yes. Um, well, we need a substitute teacher for middle school religious ed. I was like, no, no, no. I don't do that. I teach adults, you know. So I said, no. She said, oh, okay. Hung up the phone. Uh-oh. And then I was like, okay. So I call her back. Okay, look, I'll do it one week. It's just a substitute, right? Yeah, substitute. So I came and I went to the class and it was just this miserable failure. Because I, I didn't really know how to t- talk to middle school kids. And so I thought, geez, it's over. Great. You know, I left. I went home. She called me the next week. <laughs> Can you come this week? Because we still, this teacher's not back yet. <sighs> okay. All right. So I came again um, because I was saying yes now, right? Um, but anyway, as it turned out, they didn't have a te- teacher for that class. <laughs> she was calling me every week, you know. <laughs> so I... That's how I got that very, I was kicking and screaming. I was like, no, didn't want to do it. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that was sort of my early, you know, that just for me to say yes when everything was saying no was a big deal for me. Now I look back and think, oh, that was, you know, easy compared to some of the things I was asked after that. But um, I think it's there, you know, and every step is sort of that way, like, no, I don't think I can do that. You know, so, um, yeah, that's all part of it, giving your, surrendering your life over. That's your lifelong process of becoming a saint, I guess. Okay, um, I want to talk to you just a couple of minutes about Mary, and then I'm gonna, I want to go back to the film just because um, one of my favorite um, two people in the whole world, Mother Teresa and Edith Stein, who's right here. You probably all know Mother Teresa, right, because everybody knows who she is. But hardly anybody knows, how many of you know who Edith Stein is? Not the team, not the team. No, see, don't even know her. So I have a, I love Edith Stein so much, I feel like I need to share her story. So I want to go back to the film and let you see her story. Um, But before we do that, 
where is Mary in all of this? You know, um, Mary is in the communion of saints and belongs in the communion of saints and is, um, as the first Christian, <laughs> the first follower, the Christ bearer, um, she is the saint among saints, is what we call her. Um, and so I gave you a lot of handouts. I want you to, to kind of read and, and go through and think about her if you haven't thought about Mary, the mother of Jesus, in this particular way. She was a real person. She really lived. She really existed. She was really human. Um, she was a, a Jewish woman. She was a peasant woman. She wasn't anyone who was considered, um, un, you know, unusual or gifted or anything in her community. Um, she lived in a rural village, you know. Um, we do know that she was um, a very obedient and and very pure kind of young woman when she was asked to be the mother of Jesus. And so I always say she was one of those women that didn't have any idea what she was getting into when she said yes, <laughs> you know. So um, we look at her, um, I think part of her attraction and why people love her so much is because she she represents um, everything that's good about humanity. Everything that's good. Um, she, she did everything right, you know. But yet she was she was really human. It, you know, Jesus was really a, a human, but he was divine too. So we have the divine, the human and the divine coming together in a very unusual way. And of course, we all love Jesus of Nazareth, the man, because of his humanity too. But Mary was truly a real person, a human, just like us. And so I think that's why we relate to her so well. Mary is throughout the scriptures. Um, she appears a lot more in Luke's gospel than any of the other gospels. Um, but you can find her story everywhere. And so um, when we think of her, rather than thinking of her as being a separate person from the community of saints, we need to place her back in to where she belongs, which is that the intercessor for us, the person we can go to to pray with us, to companion us just like any of the saints. Um, we can ask her to pray for us. Um, she can be our spiritual mother, <laughs> filling in the gaps of where we have probably where human mothers have failed us, she can fill that in. And so we need to get to know her, too, as a person, even though we're going back to ancient history to know her. We can't see a picture of her like Father Robert Barron is showing, except for art artistic renderings. There's another whole video that he's made about Mary, and I'm going to show you pieces of that, especially as we get closer to Advent and Christmas. So we'll kind of leave that uh, um, right now, but I just wanted to bring that up tonight so that you can consider that as well, consider her as well, I should say. Um, there are um, many uh, holy days and that we, that we um, attribute to her. There are dogma and doctrines about her that we all will, we will continue to explore as we go on. So please read the handouts I gave you, especially those ones on Mary, so that you can have some background when we start talking about her again. All right, so I want to show you this last part. Um, there's only 15 minutes left uh, about Edith Stein. And the, the very last one he talks about is Mother Teresa, so we'll see how much we can cram in here. But um, Edith Stein, I think, is at least 10 minutes, so I'm not sure if we'll get to the other one or not. But anyway, so I think it would be a good way to end. What, agree? All right, so let me put it, put it up. Hopefully I can... Get it. Loving God, we thank you for the many men and women who have gone before us, who have given their lives so that we could be illuminated by, what, by how they followed you and how they loved you. And help us all to will the one thing. Give us that, the strength and the courage of Sister Edith Stein 
and the justice of Catherine Drexel and the wonderful simplicity and love of St. Therese and all of the others. And tonight as we go back to our homes, um, give us a restful night. If it be your will, just speak to us in our dreams of all of this. And give us another day tomorrow, another chance to know and love you more. And we make this prayer in the name of all that is holy and good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. See you next week.